again. Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the virtual breakfast sessions. My name is Larry Sashin, and today we have a wonderful, wonderful panel of people to discuss women-owned, managing on an uneven playing field. But first, we have to speak about our sponsors, Produce Experience. Produce Experience, if your restaurant needs and wants the highest quality produce, salads, herbs, and tropical produce, look to produce experience in there and their beautiful, beautiful stuff. So number one, let's go around the room and introduce ourselves. Diana, why don't you start? Um, hi, my name is Diana DeLucia. I'm the founder of a uh, brand titled Golf Kitchen. It's a magazine um, that covers the private golf club industry chefs. And it's both, um, you know, a book, books and a magazine in its sixth year and an event in its fifth year and an invitational in its second year. So I just keep trying to develop the brand and continue expanding it um, as best I can for the industry. Okay. Jacqueline, you're uh -huh. up. Hi, Jacqueline Glasser. I am CEO and one of the founders of newish to market brand of uh, fully cooked and smoked lamb charcuterie products, Aussie Select, as well as a co-founder of the Food Industry Conference Knees. Okay, Carolyn. Hi, I'm Caroline. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Cafe Grumpy. We're a roaster retailer based out of Brooklyn, New York, and we have 12 locations. Um, most of them in New York, New Jersey, and one in Coral Gables. And we sell specialty coffee, tea, um, merchandise, things like that, pastries. Okay. So we we all know, you know, supposedly back in the 70s, uh, there was an ad, I think it was for Benson and Hedges cigarettes that was... Uh, a cigarette that was designed just for women it was long and thin. And this, and the catch line was, you've come a long way, baby. Uh, to a woman, probably that was insulting itself. But uh, yes, you have come a long way. Uh, the difference uh, in women in business from when I started work to now is huge. Um, Never in my life did I ever think that I'd be working for a woman, but I am. I am. And, um, you know, rather than me talk about this, Diana, tell me about when you started your business, what it was like, and some of the things you had to overcome. Well, I came from a publication when I moved to the U.S. I had a publication in New York City. New York Restaurant Insider, and we did that for about six years and closed it in the recession in 2009, 10 kind of thing. And then, you know, I got known as a really good food photographer, you know, citywide, and I wanted to write a book. And I wanted to get out of the New York scene. If back then it was like blogging and everybody's doing exactly the same thing, everybody's writing about the same people, and there was no kind of nothing new to explore anymore, um, you know, and bloggers became the, the main thing. So it was like, okay, I've got to find something new to do. And I wanted to be highlighting chefs still, but I wanted a category that weren't being um, covered, that were not getting any attention or airway or TV time or magazine time. So I started looking up, you know, yacht clubs, golf clubs, country clubs, polo, Formula One, and then I decided on the topic after speaking to a bunch of people, um, and I went on a journey to write my first book, Golf Club World, and that was really when the challenges began, right from the get-go. Um, so it was more, I knew I was going into a man's world because it was all just men playing golf and very few women, and there, were, there weren't many people in the industry that were women. Uh, maybe on the staff side, front of the house, things of that nature. So then um, I knew I had to work with 98.5% 90, men, so I needed to really believe in what I was doing. Um, so I kind of got 
rejected on my first concept by any single club with a board and then I would literally go there and then the board would say no and I would say okay well I get do these golf clubs have anywhere that doesn't have a board because then I knew I could get the assignment because then they wouldn't have to go through 12 people or 13 or however many they have so I found um Michael Pascucci in Southampton New York um, a one owner club in um in between Shinnecock Hills and National Golf Links and I called after doing some research on the chef of course um, and I knew the chef would know who I was or I would know someone he had worked for in his alumni past so I made the call and I was out there like a week later and then we began the with the guidance of uh, Michael Pascucci I began my first book project and we published that in 2013, went went all over the world, went to Australia too, by the way, and that book sold out. So that was kind of like the proof of concept. And then I started doing magazine articles. But with getting back to the man thing, it was always a man that I had to work with to get through the door. So I got used to it and I did have four brothers growing up. So I was kind of like it wasn't a new thing for me. And I also, I also find that, um, and I wrote about this when I was very young, that women, even though they say the women's, you know, we all back each other up, that's not in fact true all the time. Like, in fact, that's probably not true very often when you're running your own business. Um, and I did write about it many years ago and it got published in one of the magazines, I think it was New Idea in, in Australia at the time. And... I didn't really have a lot of problems with the men in the private golf space because they were all really supportive. It was more the people outside the space that wanted to be in the space. And that's where it became very challenging for me. Why? Well, because it's very hard to break into that industry. So they see me as a, um, a gatekeeper of sorts. <clears throat> Like, can you introduce me to X, Y, Z? And I I was new to the industry, so I didn't know why these people were asking me, can you introduce me to X, Y, Z, or can you get me tea time here? Or, I don't even play golf. So for me, that was very <laughs> challenging. So okay. Okay. I wasn't there for golf. I didn't, I was there for the chefs and to, and, I, and over the years, I when I did my second book and traveled the world, that was titled Golf Kitchen. That was when I started learning the ropes of what the industry is all about and on the culinary side. And I just kept pushing through and I would get like challenges would happen all the time, all the time. And I would just go, I just, I can't get emotional. I have, even though sometimes I have, I definitely have, but you have to just keep pushing through. And I, and every single person you meet, you never know, what I'm realizing is you might really care about people and they might think you think they care about you the way you care about them, but really they don't care at all. Like, and then six months later, they're, they're gone. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Like, and I'm talking business colleagues, like not, not so much, you know, relationships or anything. That's universal between men, women. It's the same. It's the same. There are a lot of people that, that smile, shake your hand and are plotting against you at the same time. Yeah, true. Uh, Jacqueline, what in your rise uh, were similar or different? And I think that I was fortunate generationally to have others paving a bit of a way um, before my my rise, so to speak. Folks like Diana, um, who have been really successful as as women leaders. Um, I think what resonates with what Diana has just said is I work in the meat industry. It's certainly a man's world. And then when you couple that with um, chefs and, and the kitchen space, um, it's it's men times two. Um, but I think that when you're good at what you do, you earn respect of people. And I don't generally look at myself as a woman in business. I look at myself as a successful person in business. Um I think we've, you know, as, as women, we certainly struggle with things that men don't have to think about um, being emo more emotional 
Um, our leadership style, you know, you're either too aggressive or you're too passive. I don't think that those are things that men always get comments on. Um, but I don't know, maybe it's just the adaptability of, of people who are our leaders. Um, it's never been anything that's held me back. Um, I think imposter syndrome is real. I think that that's probably something that women suffer from more than more than men. Um, Explain that, please. It, <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, it's it, it, so I, my boyfriend, um, when I started dating him a couple of years ago, I mentioned imposter syndrome and he looked at me like I had seven heads. Same thing. Explain that, please. I, I What does that mean? Um, but it's this feeling that you've risen into a place that you don't necessarily deserve. And that one day someone's going to call you on it and realize, and, and everyone's going to realize that you're an imposter, that you don't belong there, um, that you've faked it until you've made it um, and, and call you on your success. And you'll be reduced back uh, to, to where you belong, um, so to speak. And it's incredible how many women suffer from it. Uh, I, I am really fortunate to have a a group of fantastic industry colleagues across the gamut um, from marketing to sales, to publishing, to research and chefs, et cetera. And all of them, in my opinion, are at the top of their game and all of them suffer from some semblance of, of this imposter syndrome, um, oh. myself included. So again, I don't think that that's something, um, and I don't want to put words in men's mouth, but I don't think that that's something that men often uh, worry about. So Again, a woman in, in business, yes, but more a, a successful person in business who just has to deal with some some women traits <laughs> on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, okay. Carolyn, so why don't you get into this conversation? You're you're in retail. Yeah, which and is coffee. a completely different animal. Yeah, but I feel like it's kind of and it's interesting because in coffee also, I feel like when we first started, it was 2005, it was a lot of just guys in coffee, you know, people would come in and be like, let me talk to the owner. And I'm like, I am the owner. Um, where's the, you know, where's the guy in charge? So it's, it's changed a little bit, I think in the last um, 10 years, but that was definitely a challenge. And then what resonated with me that um, Jacqueline and Diana were mentioning was just, um, obviously it's kind of, you know, stereotypical to say is like the emotion, but I think people, when you're dealing with staff or coworkers, they kind of come to you and like unload on you and are looking for you to be the leader, but also to give them emotional support. So you have to really um, be adaptable and be able to keep your own feelings in check a lot of the time and just sort of put on whatever you brave face sort of thing. Um, so I, I think that's something that women definitely deal with a little bit more than men. I feel like people kind of go to them for things that they might otherwise not share with um, men in it, in work. So that becomes its own, you know, pressure. Is this a generational, do you see difference between the generations on how they view uh, women in business? I think so. Okay. What do you mean to talk to me about that? Well, I've got two daughters um, and when I was um, their age, there was, um, you know, women were seen very differently back in the 80s and 90s than they are today. Now the young, younger people, if they're raised right, you know, the young people are finding ways to have equal relationships. Um, at least that's my experience with my children. Um, my daughter's managed to find her own way um, she's a co-CEO of a new tech startup company and she's found a way to make everything work. Um, whereas I had to kind of, as they say, just like keep rolling with the punches, but I would I'm not the kind of person that gives up. So I'll always just keep going. But it was that those difficult times that got me through to have the confidence level to break into an industry that I absolutely am really passionate about. So that's the one thing that always connects a woman owned business. And whether it's Caroline or Jacqueline or any business owned by a woman is most of the time, I'm not saying all it's coming from the heart first. Like the money part doesn't come first for me. That's secondary to the original product. Okay, and and to stay true to, you know, the original vision, that's just 
my two cents. So Jacqueline, you keep shaking your head. Yeah, I, I agree with that so much. <laughs> I, I, um, I've been quoted many a times as saying, especially with the launch of my um, Hotel Chefs Conference, this is not the retirement plan. I'm doing this because it's the right thing to do for the industry and for the people and because the industry needed it. Um, not, not for the money, not for the finance, really for the passion. And with passion um, comes success. Um, I, I think that that's certainly very, very true. Okay. And I, 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 I totally agree. And I also feel like we use our instinct to make decisions a little bit more. And like, you really do have to follow what you think is right. Even maybe if the money doesn't come and right away, you kind of feel like, well, if I do the right thing, it's it's going to be okay. So I think that's a common thread. Okay. You know, so I think what I've heard is that you're talking about women themselves look at business differently than they did 30 years ago, 40 years ago. How are you perceived by the different generations? I mentioned at the beginning that I worked for a company. Um and that was all men. I mean, the president and the three vice presidents were men. The fashion director was a man, but the art director was a woman. And that's the way the model, the way things were. That's totally different now. Uh, you are products of that, the, the, the change. So how general, generationally, how are you perceived by people my age, 10 years younger. I mean, how is it perceived on the male side? Because that's who you have to work with. I think that is a, as a, as a, a woman, it's my perceived, it's my perception of how they look at me as opposed to how they actually do perceive me okay so as a woman you might feel insecure about something and then you know it'll be on your mind all the time like with me it's probably going to be 24 hours of obsession um and then you know you get another phone call and it was totally like mis misconceived perception on my behalf that would be the best way I could explain it you know, like I'll have someone call me and say, you have no idea how much you've done for the golf industry, for the chefs in the industry. It was just yesterday uh, one of the general managers was telling me that, you know, back in 2010 to 2015, none of these guys were getting covered. They had no press time. They had no, no media time, you know, and you went out there and just went for it and now they have, you know, they have chef to chef but the private golf club space particularly, you know, that's a very niche, small market that nobody wanted anyone to know what was going on behind the gates. So, you know, we really built that. But I couldn't have done it without the men and their support. And I, it's, I, I understand that sometimes I do mis, misconstrue their vision of me because that's just within me, but that's not necessarily how they perceive me and my business and what I'm doing. You know, it's an interesting thing, at least, you know, on my side of the, uh, the equation, is that in many cases, um, uh, a leader in a man is called assertive and a woman is called bossy. Um, have you run across something like that? And how have you overcome that? I don't know if it's bossy, more bitchy. <laughs> okay. I'm I'm trying to keep this PG. <laughs> Go ahead, keep going. Um, yeah, and it, and if anyone's overcome it, please uh send me the tips. Um no, I don't think I have overcome it. I think um it it's a it's a really hard balance to strike to to be assertive, um to be knowledgeable, to be successful and to not offend. Uh it's it's a, a very delicate balance. I don't think that I do it very well, honestly, on, on a day-to-day -day basis. I, I can be post-apologetic. Um, perhaps that's, again, just a, a personality thing. Um, but when, that was the first kind of the first comment that I made. And I think piggybacking off of Diana, I, I think as, as women, we bring certain 
personality characteristics to the plate uh, that that make in general being a, a a woman in a leadership position difficult. Okay, yeah, because what you you know everybody goes out and recruits the alpha males. Okay, so if everybody's an alpha, um, how do you maintain your alpha status, uh, Caroline? Well, I, I think as far as like communicating and trying to be, you know, not bitchy, but getting what people to do what you want them to do. I, I've been trying, I feel like I default to like humor a little bit, maybe too much. So I try to, you know, make, just make things a little more lighthearted. If I have to tell someone something, I'll just, you know, maybe be a little bit sarcastic. So that's sort of my default, but it works with some people, not all people. So sometimes I do end up doing more things myself than I should. And, you know, don't delegate as much as I should because of that, but it's a constant challenge and it really depends on the people you work with. But just to go back to the generation thing, I feel like as we, we have quite a few different generations working for us, but as far as like in the coffee shops, um, I would say they trend towards like a little bit younger now. And I, I, I do think their perception of just gender roles in general has definitely changed and um, is completely different. Like um, Diana mentioned about her daughters. So uh, and Diana, you work with people who have tremendous egos. I mean, chefs are artists. Uh, you know, they, they, they rule the roost. Uh, general managers of golf clubs are alpha males. Um, how do you walk through that kind of minefield and uh, get the job done? Um, well, like I said, nobody was doing what I was doing, like at all. So... Um, I think it was better that I was a woman and better that I didn't play golf, number one, because I was, okay, I'm not there for tea times. I'm not there for the golf course, which back then that was like hallowed ground. It still is. But I could see a, a, an opening there on the culinary side because I used to think, you know, there's a lot of old white men here playing golf and you don't want anyone to see what's happening behind the gates or in the clubhouse, what your chefs are doing. Meanwhile, Food Network's out there and all the restaurant chefs are getting all the attention. And I was just thinking, well, these guys are not getting any attention. They're not going to be in, you know, chefs, like you said, have that little bit of an ego and they want to show their work off, whether it's a private club or not. And um, that was, I kind of like, that was a model I was going to go on. And I really didn't have a lot of trouble with the chefs or the GMs, to be honest. It, I, I just knew if, if it was going to be a yes, it was going to be a yes really fast. Um, and if it was going to be a no, it was going to take a long time. So now if it's a no, it's just for me, okay, it's just not the right time. And I've proven that time and time again because clubs that said no in the beginning, I've all covered them all because they've called me back to give their chefs some publicity. And I, I really care about it. So, you know, I don't do an artificial intelligence piece. I actually write my stories like in full. And I try to put as much emotion in, into the story as possible. And I think that's one of the things that makes a lot of difference because I really do connect with the, the chefs. Um, I'm not sure if it's the same with, in lamb and coffee, but uh, you guys are all working with chefs or, um, you know, coffee sales is one of the hardest things it must be to open 12 coffee shops when there's so many coffee shops. So you have to be doing something extremely right. Yeah, well, we have, and we, we have the coffee roastery. So I do have to like relate to the people doing the roasting. So in the past, I've just tried to make, you know, go to classes and get certification so that we can have like this co communication and people kind of, it's almost like to get people to respect my palate and my opinion, because I, I have the certification now, whereas it, it would have been the same if I didn't have them, but it's sort of like trying to prove yourself so you can um, relate in a different way. You know, we're, we're touching on, we keep touching on the people on the top. There are people who, you know, your dishwashers, uh, your laborers, um, Jacqueline, Carolyn, your dishwashers. How do you deal with people whose um, traditions are men of the rulers and, 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 and you have them working for you? How do you set expectations for people so that they know right from the beginning that you are, um, you're the top? 
I mean, I, I don't know. We just, as far as, I don't know if we set those expectations. I, we do have a like a, a good onboarding process where everyone, you know, reads about how they have to treat everyone with respect and, you know, things like that. But I don't, I don't feel like, I try to also be like in working with people. So I don't want to see, seem like uh, there's super hierarchy where I am in the top. I try to make it more like it's a collaboration, maybe sometimes to a fault, but I like to, you know, have, if people don't agree with me, I'm happy to discuss things. So I kind of like to keep it more like we're all sort of in a collaborative process and, and to make things work better that way. So then people feel like they have ownership of how the company goes. And I feel like that ends up working better and people feel more proud of things. So I've, I've done all the jobs and I will do all the jobs um, on any any given day. Um, if if something needs to get done, it doesn't matter what the task is. I'm, I'm willing to jump in and, and do it. Um, so I think that that management quality of everyone being, you know, stepping in and, and at any time somebody can be the leader, um, even the dishwasher, you know, it obviously as an analogy can be, can be a leader in a, in a given moment. Um, and so creating those opportunities for leveling the playing field as, as Caroline said, I think helps, um, you know, when I go out and I'm, I'm doing events, I'm on the floor, opening the boxes, uh, packing the gift bags, you know, whatever needs to get done, work, working the food show. Um, and no job is too small, no, or menial or, or whatnot. And I think that that just, that earns respect of the folks that work for you. Um, I'm going to go into the audience and put some people on the spot. Uh, Carly, please unmute yourself. <laughs> Carly? Is Carly there in name or just? Okay, Joyce, unmute yourself. So Good Joyce, morning, everyone. Good. Nice to see you. Joyce, tell Good everybody nice. who you are. Uh, I'm a uh, uh, editor of the news column and a senior contributing writer at Total Food Service. I've been in the industry with nonprofits and PR and working with branding uh, companies. And I've also seen the changes that you've all talked about that uh, today we are uh, actually uh, able to have the playing field be a little more leveled. While you were all speaking, all I could think about was, what are the options for the young people? I'm very connected to um, education in high school and scholar scholarships for those women and young men who want to enter the industry and continue their professional development. And really, what are the, you know, for women, where, where and what can they do in order to get into the industry? Years ago, you'd have them lining up at the doors of Daniel Ballou's, you know, Danielle would work for him for two weeks without a paycheck. Well, today, we, you talked about passion, but really, everything is turned upside down right now. How can someone really follow their passion and not be concerned about the financial stress? And I think... That's what we're all learning today as women, that yes, we can follow our passion, but we have to think more about, about the financial um, success that will go along with it. Because at the end of, you know, when we're 60, if we have no pension and if we have none of the safety nets, um, you know, what was it really all for? If so I think that's what's, what women are thinking about now, which I'm, I'm happy to see because I just read that, you know, Gavin Newsom just raged, raised the minimum wage. He signed the bill in uh, California. At $20 um, an hour, isn't it? In, yeah. But you know, how well, do you relate? How do you relate? You, you, I mean, you work with Fred, you mm -hmm. work with Mike, you work with me. Uh, fairly difficult people. <laughs> um, how do you assert yourself in this and uh, not damage, uh, not damage any relationships? Well, sometimes we fight, you know, because I have an opinion. Um, but when my opinion is based in fact, and merit, 
Um, and I can communicate that information so that everyone in the room can understand it, what the benefits are, the pros, the cons. Um, it doesn't matter that I'm a woman in the room. It's really, what am I saying? How am I saying it? And is it true? If I come into the room and all the time I'm not telling you things that are true, are you going to believe me? Are you going to want to work with me? So I think I think that's what that's really the nature of collaboration. You have to collaborate today unless you you know you're a single entrepreneur, but you're never working alone. And if you haven't learned how to work with others and be on the playground and play with everyone, you know, then you're isolated. So mm -hmm. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, you brought in something that we haven't touched on, education. Uh, when I went to school, uh, men were taught to be leaders and women, their education was geared towards teaching or for office work or art. Um, they were steered in a different direction. Um, I truly don't believe that's <laughs> the way it is right now. Um, but when in education, I think Caroline touched on it when you when you do training, um, what is the focus uh, on the training? You, you touched on equality, how you treat everybody the same. But how do you stress that? I mean, I, I feel like it's just you it's the culture that you build. It just kind of happens if as long as you just as you go, you're just respectful to everyone and, and hear everybody out. And I mean, it does take a lot of time to listen. You know, I, we have a Slack channel that sometimes drives me crazy because we have, I think about 60 staff right now. So everybody wants you to hear what they have to say and you have to really, you know, be mindful of how you respond to people and just take in their considerations and suggestions. So it's, it's like a work in progress and it's sometimes you don't, <laughs> sometimes I don't want to collaborate. I don't want to listen. I just want to go away hide but you know it's you have to be there be active and like engaging and um put aside maybe your feelings and the moment and just kind of accept accept um people and I, I don't I just think you have to be open-minded and supportive of people that work for you and it ends up building with like a positive environment for them so I don't know if that answers the question, but it, no, it, 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 it's sort of the center of, of, of the way it should be. Jacqueline, how are you dealing with that in your organization? I, I mean, I think I echo everything that Caroline just said. I, 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 I struggle a little bit with the overall topic because I, I'll go back to how I, how I commented in the very beginning. I, I'm not, I don't tr I try not to define myself as as a woman in in a role, I try to define myself as a as a successful leader, um, surrounded by other successful people, and manage my own personal emotions and and personality traits, um, digging into my passion and and kind of just getting the job done. Um, I think one thing that hasn't been touched on that I I certainly wanted to to make mention of is the other the other component of being a female in, in a leadership role is, you know, it's not just about the job. Oftentimes we have a lot of things at home that are pulling us in a completely opposite direction. Um, the, the kids or the spouse or a significant other, uh, the expectation that the house is going to be clean or dinner is going to be made. And, and certainly that's, that's not a hundred percent of the time. There are a lot of families who have really found balance, but um, I think it's another another struggle um for a for a female who needs to work when you're when you're a leader your job never ends so you know i'm answering emails especially because i work around the world i'm answering emails at 10 o'clock at night six o'clock in the morning um and yet i need to be at after school pickup at four or the the band concert at seven um it's I think that that's the other the other piece that's worthy of of commenting on in terms of being a, a woman leader is is that home uh, homework uh, balance that often men don't necessarily feel as strong a pull um, or a, I, the, the guilt factor. I think mom guilt is a real real thing. <laughs> Doris, you had your hand raised. So so one of the things I think that we we sort of not really discussed what's really basic here is we're talking about business. 
whether you're a woman in business or a man in business, you're still talking about accounting and finance and marketing and sales and operations and all the things that are business. We're all talking the same language. If we were in football, the sport, whether we're a man or a woman, we'd all be talking the same language, just like Diana. If we were in the golf industry, we'd all be talking using the language of golf. So really by saying women in business, we're still talking the same language. So if you understand the business, then you will be successful. And like you, like I was saying before, Larry, you asked me, well, how do I you know, get along with the men I work with? If you understand and you can communicate that you understand the business and you are a successful person in business, then you should be able to get along with just about anyone. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Agreed. But how do you get yourself heard those first times? That's, you know, people have a wealth of knowledge in their head. Not everyone can get that knowledge out and be able to impart uh, that knowledge into a group. Uh, how do you, how do you, you know, we're talking about kicking the can down the road. How do you get that first kick in? Confidence. Well, having a mentor, having a mentor in the industry is probably, you know, or, or a life coach, you know, uh, helping you to understand things that you don't see or that you don't know the next step is very, very important. We've been talking about mentorship for, you know, quite a while in the industry. Um, and I think that's one key component. Okay. Jacqueline, you mentioned confidence. Yeah. And I, and that plays a little bit into education too. Today's students are, they're learning much more how to be confident, how to put themselves out there, how to have their ideas be heard, um, stand on stage, you know, back in the day, <laughs> just to, to show my age, that didn't happen. Um, I, I watch the opportunities that my children are afforded um, at their school on a, on a weekly basis um, to be leaders and, and to develop confidence in your voice. Uh, for, for folks like Caroline and Diana and myself, we were fortunate enough, whether it was through a mentor or supportive family unit or another person in our lives, that that confidence was instilled in us um, and gave us the ability to be in these positions today. But I think that this is going to it's going to happen more and more um, as the next generation ascends, boys and girls, um, mm -hmm. not just girls. And because I think it's to Joyce's point it's a business. Um, and we're talking about women in business, but you, you know, you can flip the script and, and talk about men who have not been able to get, to get into leadership roles. Um, and it's often because they may, you know, potentially lack confidence or opportunity or, or whatnot. So, um, yeah, I think confidence, passion, fortitude, they're all un they're not classes that you can take in school, but they're certainly traits that you can, that can be developed through experience. You know, it, it, you, you turned on confidence. You, you, you mentioned confidence. Um, you said the difference in education. We were taught to be part of a team, to be part of a team. Uh, the children of today are more ego, egocentric um, that you see a generation where me is more important than the group. And... Um, dealing with the younger generations you have you know we did what we were told um we, you know we learned to follow the rules do what you're told and um i guess it was my generation that broke that when we started demonstrating on the streets in in the late 60s and into the 70s but today's youth has a different mindset both men and women both men and women how do you deal with that, Carolyn? Because you're dealing with so many different locations, so mm -hmm. many different areas, so many different types of people. Yeah, that That is definitely a challenge because I think people are, well, they're more assertive about themselves and they do think about themselves first, whereas maybe other people in the past hadn't done that. So I feel like it's an ongoing, I feel for me, it's an ongoing challenge personally, but I think if the 
environment supports what they want, um, then they're going to like participate more. So it's it's very complicated. <laughs> and I think about it this all the time, actually, because I do feel like people just care about themselves more lately. And it is stress, stress, stresses me out a little bit. But um, it just means that you have to, you know, I don't know if you have to kind of react and like I said before, listen. And if you have to make some changes to make their situation easier or their perception of their situation easier or do things where it might help everybody in a different way that you might not think about, um, you're just going to have to do that. So it might be a little expensive. Maybe it's uh, different benefits or something like that or activities that the group wants to do. Um, it just adds it adds another challenge to the business. But I think if you keep um, the younger people in this role, if you keep them happy and you are listening to what their, I guess, demands or what they expect out of their job, they're going to, you know, maybe stay there longer and give more. And I do think in general, the attitude um, as far as like customer service has um, gotten a little better. So I think the, the younger generation they might be more demanding with what they want or expect and think about themselves a little bit more um, focused on themselves. But I think they are a little bit more, um, they're better at customer service, a little bit nicer maybe to people and like, listen, uh, that's just a generalization, but I think I've seen that. I've seen that a little bit. Um, I don't know if that it's, okay. it's, that, it's really something I think about every It's, it's every another day. whole topic. It's another, yes, it's, it's Charles. a lot of, <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot of personalities and I definitely think society has definitely changed um and there are ways with you know so many of the staff that we have to we just have to change how we do business we have to offer different things and um just you know just roll with it <laughs> so you've noticed you've noticed that there's a change <laughs> Charles you've been uncharacteristically quiet today well first of all this is an intimidating group of women so I'm no one to keep my mouth shut um, you know, I, I will say that um, a number of things. One, um, I've been teaching um, at NYU in the hospitality program for some 17 years, and I was chairman of the board of the hotel school at the University of Houston for 15 before that. 60% um, of the people that are in hotel school today um, are women, uh, which is great. Um, secondly, as an educator, among other things, we have a responsibility going to this issue that you just mentioned a minute ago about team building, um, I build into all my classes a team building segment because of the issue that you raised. Um, and I force them to do projects together um, simply because if I were to say to you, three or four of you go together and do this project, the three guys will go to the corner, the three women to go to another corner, and I won't let that happen. Um, the same thing with people of color. They'll all gravitate to themselves. And I don't mean that disrespectfully. So I mix it all up. Um, I don't give them a choice. And then I'll sometimes go behind their backs because I know that somebody's a particular loud mouth, a man, and I will tell the women to run him over. Okay. And we'll talk about the validity of, of what's going to happen in business. And Joyce used the word first um, about business. This is business. And it really doesn't matter whether you're male or female in that regard. I think we've kind of slowly getting to that point. We're not nearly where we should be. But the fact is, as Joy said, you know, if you're going to be the manager, you're going to have to deal with finance, you're going to have to deal with accounting, you're going to have to deal with HR on a daily basis. Um, and, you know, saying to somebody, and, and actually, I think Jacqueline said it too, you know, there, you, people come with a perception of women that is unfortunately wrong and stereotypical. And Diana talked about it um, when she first approached golf clubs. And that's the other side of my business, which is the club industry. And she and I have had many conversations about this, but um, yeah, my wife was in the commercial insurance business. That's how we met more than 30 years ago. She approached clubs and she got shut down because she was a woman. Um, she'd walk into a club and say, I want to sell you insurance. And they'd say, oh, our insurance is done by Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones has done our insurance for 30 years. And then, as a number of you have mentioned, she would pull out numbers and say, Mr. Jones is ripping you off. Okay, I can give you better numbers. And all of a sudden, you know, it was, excuse the expression, but the shit hit the fan. Um, so they had to figure out a way to keep Mr. Jones in the financial picture, but yet still do a better product. So I think, you know, this group clearly realizes where the issues are. And we all have a responsibility, male and female, 
to teach that next generation um, to stand on their own two feet. Hey, thank you, Charles. Richard, Richard, you're being very quiet also. <clears throat> I'm going to follow Charles with, you know, the intimidation. Um, this is just fantastic. I'm going to give you my lens. 50 years ago, my dad, a big burly construction worker, came home, and I'm going to quote Charles and use what exactly what he said. And he goes, look, the guys at work were talking about this women's lib shit, and we're going to practice this in the house here. Now I'm 16 years old, I think, 17 years old. He said, you can do dishes, and the girls can mow the lawn. And thank God, at an early age, he taught me. So I don't necessarily see three women talking about what they've done. I see three people with vision, energy, passion, overcoming their perceived and the real. And unfortunately, the reality is probably the men throwing up too many obstacles unnecessarily to what these three fantastic people have done. So I just applaud them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's come to that time of the show when the enemy is, is time itself. So um, why don't we go around the room and do our, our little takeaway, something you want to impart in this, the viewers that are here and in the video that will follow. Uh, Diana, why don't you start? Um, well, thanks for having me on, on this topic. It's important. But one of the differences in the industry that I'm in, and I'm very fortunate, I know that, um, is everyone I work with is a leader. Every single person, whether it's an owner, a GM, or an executive chef, and everyone in the golf industry has to be the personality type that wants to make the members happy. And if you don't have that personality type, you're not going to survive very long in the industry. Like you have to, you have to be able to adapt to that. So on Jacqueline's point, younger people, it's a different concept. You cannot have that attitude in the private club space at all. Like, so it's, it, I've had a lot of mentors, 99.9% .9 are men and they're amazing men. Um, and, you know, I'm just very fortunate, but it's not all negative or anything like that. Like I'm, I'm blessed and I, I love the people I work with and I, I love what I do. And I'm pretty sure Jacqueline and Caroline are the same. I know Joyce has always been passionate about the industry. Um, so my takeaway is just let's just keep moving forward and taking each day as it comes and not not get tied up in like that imposter thing, which I get that a lot, and just try to keep moving and see it more of, um, you know, unifying kind of business models moving forward. Okay, thank you. Caroline. I was just thinking about quality and how all of our businesses are really focused on the quality of the product. And I don't know if that has anything to do with being um, women in business, but I think that's, you know, we're, that's something that we've all focused on from the start, just a high quality product and keeping that up regardless of the challenges. And just a takeaway today, I mean, thank, I'm really thankful to be on this call. And I feel like as a woman in business, when you meet other women in business, you just feel like, you know, you can relate a little bit better and you feel um, a little bit, I, it does get a little lonely sometimes. So when you meet other women in business, you do feel like a little bit of a push. And um, so I feel like it's inspiring. And if people are out there starting their own business, it's great to meet other business owners. Um, and even just if it's like once every few months, go out to lunch, just take time to chat with other business owners to keep up your motivation and to get inspired. And also just to, you know, unload sometimes and just t tell stories. So I think that can really um, help keep you going and keep you motivated. And as far as just any advice also, you need to, because it is just being a business owner is very stressful. I think you need to just make sure you take care of yourself physically because we talked about all these demands that everyone's putting on us, like family, staff, um, just the general consumers. So just taking a little time to make sure that you're physically taking care of yourself, eating well, exercising. I know it sounds silly, but I think it really does make a difference. Um, you know, putting your personal health uh, first, even though, because if you're, if you're out, you know, no one else is going to be there to do the work. So I, I think that that's something at the beginning, I kind of just, I kept going and going and didn't really take care of myself. And then I just realized, you know, you have to be at your, on your game sort of all the time. So you really need to 
um, focus on yourself once in a while, which women don't really do that often, I feel like. So that's, that's it. That's a lot, but that, that was my takeaway. I feel like we, we covered so much and there's so much to talk about. But. Yes. Yes. Jacqueline. Um, I was going to say a couple things. Say yes. Um, I think there are, there are so many fantastic opportunities out there for women to be successful and, and to be leaders, but you have to put yourself out there. You have to have confidence and, and you need to say yes. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to be here and, and sit on this panel where the, the three of us were, were given that chance to, to say yes and contribute to the conversation. Uh, you never know where the next face that you're going to meet or be exposed to is, is going to come from that's going to take you to the next level of, of opportunity or, or your career. Um, and you only get those opportunities when, when you say yes, you need to absolutely practice self-care and balance and, you know, say yes to the things that make the most sense for you, but continuously putting yourself in, in positions where you can be exposed to others. Uh, and then secondly, find your people. I mentioned I have a, a litany of, of other women who continuously lift me up and help me fight imposter syndrome every day. And um, those people that we do meet for breakfasts and lunches and, and phone hookups. And during COVID, we called it a wine and wine, uh, where we drank wine and, and whined about our lives. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, they're, they're so important. And be those people, be that person for others. Um, I went through a process where I reached out to other women leaders and and said, I'm a, a women business owner. You're a woman business owner. Let's let's do business together. So just finding areas of commonality um, to, to be those people for other people uh, and, and to find your people, I think, is really important. Yes, yes. Uh, for Total Food Service, Joyce, why don't you give a final tidbit? So I really think that we did cover a lot of ground and we're talking about business, women in business. Um, one of the most important things that we need to consider, is, which is what I brought up, is finding a mentor um, who can help you, you know, learn how to be a, a good leader, a good listener, and a good participant in the business world for women. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um... Uh, it was a wonderful panel. I, I really, really enjoyed this conversation. And by the way, when I first started the virtual breakfast sessions, one of my mentors was Joyce. And Joyce would gently critique me uh, because I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, it was This was sort of like one of those things, you know, little rascals, let's put on a show. Um, and that's what we did. And Joyce was always there. Uh, to help me out. And so when she says, get a mentor, it pays, it pays. <laughs> now, one of my observations with everything is that as long as we separate women owners, men owners, black owners, Jewish owners, whatever owners they are of a business, as soon as you start looking at people as teammates, whether you're in partnership with a, with you're a vendor and they're, and they're a client, um, you're in a partnership with people. And as long as you look at them as partners and not women partners and men partners, the more successful a partnership will be. When you look at people for their value, as opposed, you know, Martin Luther King, I think put it the best. Uh, when, you, when you look at them as it, the contact, content of their character, as opposed to their, their, the way they are, the way they look, um, you'll be more successful. And I value these three people. I notice I said people, not women. These three people who joined this session because they had a lot to say and it was valuable information. So we're at the end of the show. And before we go, I want to thank Produce Experience again. If you're looking for the finest in herbs, salads, and tropical produce, look to produce experience. And the only two things I have left to say is everyone, be positive, test negative, and I'll see you in two weeks. Bye now, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.